Hello, thank you for attending my talk. Thank you, Spark Summit, for accepting this talk. I'm very happy to be here. Um, like they said, my name's Kyle Schmaus, and I'm a data scientist at Stitch Fix. Today, I'm gonna to be speaking about methods and software for fitting hierarchical models using moment-based estimation techniques. So here's a brief overview of my talk. First, I'm gonna start by telling you a little about Stitch Fix, the company I work for. Uh, then I'll introduce hierarchical models, or mixed effects models, as they're sometimes called. I'm not gonna assume any past experience with this model type. Of course, if you have utilized mixed effects models before, I'm really happy you're here. Uh, next, I'm gonna discuss the relative benefits of fitting these models using um, some modern moment-based estimation techniques. I'll close with a brief summary of the software designed to fit these models, including the Spark package we recently open sourced at Stitch Fix. Um, a bit of warning, this is definitely gonna be a, a data science and methods heavy talk, um, but in learning about the methods, I think you'll see why um, the Spark engine is the perfect piece of technology to implement this approach. Um, so Stitch Fix is an online styling service that delivers a personalized shopping experience for our customers using a combination of machine learning and expert human judgment. If you're a customer, you sign up uh, and you fill out a style profile providing us with information about your fashion tastes, your needs, your budget, et cetera. We leverage that information using algorithms and human judgment to select a combination of five items to ship to a client. And then the client receives uh, the shipment in the mail, we call it a fix, um, and they're able to try on the new clothing in the privacy of their own home. They have a couple days to decide what they wanna keep and what they wanna send back. Um, and they provide us additional information about the items. Um, did they like the style? Was the size right? How about the quality? All of this we use to uh, get better and better over time um, and grow with our clients. Um, so I personally work on the styling recommendations team where we're responsible for our item to user recommender algorithms. Um, we use the output of a variety of models to inform and power the software utilized by our expert um, to, to power software utilized by our expert human stylists. Uh, they in turn curate the results of our algorithms, ultimately making the final selection decision on what we send out. We think this human in the loop um, recommender system is better than a 100% AI or 100% expert approach. Um, hierarchical models are one of the recommendation techniques we use on our team, so this topic is relevant. Um, the algorithm team at Data Science at Stitch Fix is 80 something strong, including data scientists and data engineers working on a variety of problems core to the business. Um, we are hiring, I should say. And if you're interested in learning more, I hope you check out our blog at multithreaded.stitchfix.com. I also hope you got the pun, multithreaded. Um, so I wanna motivate the use of hierarchical models with a simple example. It's quite simple. Um, and I'm gonna use a Stitch Fix example where we wanna predict the probability of selling an item of clothing to a client conditioned on us sending it to them. Obviously, there are a variety of approaches to this problem. Almost any supervised learning method is arguably appropriate. Um, for simplicity's sake, though, let's imagine that we wanna use a logistic regression model where our only source of data is the descriptive attributes of each item. For instance, uh, we can differentiate items by their type, uh, their size, small, medium, large, the materials they're constructed from. Uh, we can analyze and try to quantify how they fit, how they're cut, what brands they come from. Um, we can do fancier things. We can try to utilize image information, either using color, pattern, or more complicated transformations. You get the idea. Um, the important idea for this setup uh, is that for each item in our catalog, we can develop a fixed attribute vector representing it. Uh, using historical sales logs, we can create a design matrix for each previously sent item, where each row represents the corresponding attribute vector. Uh, we can also create a response vector of ones and zeros representing sale and non-sale events, all of this from our historical shipment log. Uh, from there, we can use any logistic regression software, including Spark ML Libs, uh, to learn feature weights. Of course, this approach is quite simple, obviously open to a lot of criticism. Um, the, the main criticism I wanna focus on here to help support uh, the hierarchical models is that um, the outputs of this uh, model or the predictions of this model are not gonna be personalized to individual clients. 
all of our input data and corresponding weights are tied to item information. So predictions from one user to the next will be identical. Um, obviously, this is a problem. In any recommender system, users will have different tastes, preferences, needs. Our models need to um, be able to articulate these differences if they're going to be useful in our field. Um, so here's a modification to the first approach uh, that hopefully can capture client variation. Instead of fitting one global model for all of our clients, we could fit several models. Uh, one per cluster of our clients, or potentially one even for each individual client. Um, in the setup I'm imagining, the models are identically parameterized, meaning they're fit using the same features. Um, all we have to do is partition our training data um, and call our model fitting function on each partition. Uh, again, <laughs> this approach is open to a variety of criticisms. Um, it certainly has the capability to learn individual user preferences, um, but it's potentially very inefficient. If one of our feature weights, say one of our feature weights does not vary by client, then this approach requires us to noisily relearn it for each model. Um, we're not pooling our data in any way. Um, also for users or clusters of users, depending on how we've set up the problem, um, if they don't have much data, much observations, new users for instance, um, their individual models will be necessarily imprecise just because we don't have a lot of data. So um, this is a bit of a setup. I presented two more or less bad approaches to this problem. Um, here's a better, more useful approach. Um, a, higher mark, uh, excuse me, a hierarchical model is a natural data-driven middle ground uh, between using a global shared generalized linear model and a collection of individually fit models, one per data group. Um, in general, for a generalized linear uh, hierarchical model or generalized linear mixed effects model, we have M grouping levels representing some natural partitioning of our data, clients in my strained example. Um, and we end up fitting a model with two types of coefficient vectors and two design matrices. Um, as you can see in the slide, the, uh, the beta coefficient vector is shared across each grouping level. So that kind of represents the average or the global estimate in our model. Um, well, uh, uh, we fit a set of gamma vectors um, for each grouping level. So if you look at the uh, notation on, or the equations on the screen, um, our i is our index for each grouping level. We can imagine we have um, m y sub i vectors. Um, we're learning m gamma sub i's. Each one of those equations, though, is going to share one beta. Uh, and we assume that the gamma sub i's come from um, a multivariate Gaussian distribution, zero centered and with a, a covariant sigma. So uh, this approach is, um, oh, before I talk about that, um, the two design matrices, um, depending on the model that we're setting up, uh, often these x sub i and z sub i will be identical. This has everything to do with what features do we want to include um, in the global modeling of the problem and what features do we want to include at the individual group levels. Um, if that's confusing, just assume that x sub i and z sub i are identical. Uh, this approach is somewhat similar to ridge regression. Um, you can formulate ridge regression in a sort of Bayesian interpretation where your coefficients have some normal distribution uh, similar to this. Um, this is at least superior in one way in that we end up estimating the sigma covariance um, as we fit beta and gamma. So that's not pre-fit or tuned. We don't use cross-validation. That's another part of the model that we're learning. Um, and it has a bit of an automatic relevancy detection flavor. Um, if there's not much distribution uh, between certain weights across our grouping level, we'll learn that the covariance there is small. As there is, we'll learn that the covariance there is large, et cetera. Um, so let's compare these three methods that I've described on some artificial simulation data. Um, I've switched to a linear model instead of a logistic, but the conclusions should be similar. Um, I've uh, randomly sampled uh, 100 groups, um, and for each one of those, I've generated a design matrix of uh, 10 columns with unit interval distribution um, plus an intercept column. I then randomly generated one beta vector shared across all groups, um, a gamma vector for each group, um, and some sigma co uh, covariance matrix that had an inverse Wishart distribution just so it's totally random. Uh, I could not have set it up. 
Um, and then we're going to compare the performance of the three approaches I laid out um, using root mean squared error on a held out test data set. Um, we repeat this process several times, varying the number of observations per grouping level. Uh, so one thing we can see is that uh, the shared model doesn't really uh, care or improve with increased observations per grouping level. Um, oh, I should mention that the horizontal axis here is log scale. Um, this makes sense. So uh, there's only about 11 parameters in this model that we're fitting. So we don't actually need that much data to get a fairly precise estimate of what those coefficients are. If we have just 10 estimates per grouping level, that's still a thousand random variable or a thousand observations total, more than enough to get a pretty good read um, on just 11 coefficients. Um, the individual models. Um, perform very poorly, as we would expect, um, when the number of observations per grouping level is low. Here you're trying to fit 11 parameters um, on 16 observations, on 32 observations. Necessarily, that has to be imprecise. Um, quite quickly, though, as we increase the number of observations per grouping level, uh, the performance gets much, much better. Um, the interesting thing about this plot is the performance of the hierarchical model. Uh, the output of this model is going to um, in a data-driven way, interpolate between the global average um, for grouping levels that don't have much observations um, and the individual mo grouping model when a grouping level does have many observations, does it in a nice automatic data-driven way. Um, for this toy setup, once we have about 1,000 observations per group, there really is no difference between the individual um, and the hierarchical model approaches. Uh, that number is going to vary. Um, that point of inflection is going to vary depending on how the problem is set up. Uh, but it is something interesting to keep in mind. So um, that's one motivation uh, for, well, I'll go back a little bit. That's one motivation for hierarchical models. If you're thinking about clients, um, this is a nice way to deal with sort of cold start issues. As a client signs up, you don't know that much about them. As they stick around, you learn more and more. Uh, this model nicely interpolates uh, between the behavior of different kinds of clients and different numbers of observations. There's a variety of software implementations for hierarchical models. Here are a few that I've used. Um, probably the most common um, used out there, at least in academia, um, is the R package LME4. Um, there are also implementations in Python and Julia. All of these are really good. Uh, the R package MBEST is relevant for us today um, because it implements some of the moment-based estimation techniques uh, I'll be discussing. Um, we've copied these techniques into our Spark implementation. Um, if you aren't working on big data, uh, the R implementation is probably good enough. Um, but for industrial scale data, uh, R is going to falter. Uh, lastly, you can fit hierarchical models in just about any probabilistic programming language. Um, if this is something you're used to, go ahead and pick your favorite. So let's talk about how we fit hierarchical models. Um, by far, the most common methods for fitting hierarchical models are some form or another of likelihood maximization, as is the case with a lot of supervised learning. Uh, when it comes to computational complexity, these approaches require an initial cost on the order of n times q squared and then a series of iterations on the order of m times q to the fourth, um, whereas the slide says n is the number of total observations, q is the, uh, the sum of our, our fixed and random effects. So fixed effects is the, the beta coefficients, or the x features. Uh, random effects in the literature are the uh, gamma coefficients and the z features. So it's the total column sum of your x and your z matrices. And then m is the number of groups, as I stated previously. Um, as I mentioned, for industrial scale data, this can be slow, sometimes prohibitively slow. It's really the iterative step that's killing us. Um, interesting models I fit in the past before these moment-based techniques um, became available could take hours or days to fit, um, which is just practically prohibitive in a lot of use cases. Um, moment-based methods, on the other hand, um, require, again, a um, NQ squared uh, step. Um, but then only one step uh, on the order of m to q to the fourth. Um, so not an iterative step, just the one step. Um, once more, using this approach, we can trivially spread it across k processors, um, which really gives us dramatic performance improvements. Um, there is, these improvements in computation are paid for uh, by sacrificing some statistical inefficiency. 
Um, I'm not gonna get into that quite uh, a lot in this talk. Um, that said, uh, the degradation in accuracy in practice is often negligible, sometimes non-existent. Um, the moment-based procedures are asymptotically consistent. They have a lot of well-understood theoretical guarantees, so it's not something to be worried about. Um, so, <laughs> uh, I warned you at the beginning of the talk that I'm gonna be focusing on data science and methods. I wanna talk through a little bit of the math. Um, I think it's really cool. Also, I think going through um, the broad strokes of the algorithm uh, motivate why it's a perfect fit for Spark. Um, so I'm gonna focus on linear models here, but everything extends uh, to generalized linear models. Um, pick your family that you wanna fit. Uh, again, we have M grouping levels. Um, for each grouping level, we have some response, Y sub I. We assume that that uh, is generated by some X sub I beta plus Z sub I gamma sub I um, product sum um, with some noise. The gamma sub i's and the epsilon sub i's are assumed to be uh, normally distributed and are independent of one another and themselves. Um, let's put a couple, there we go. Uh, so the first step in this approach is generating, um, for each grouping level, uh, some least squares coefficient uh, estimate. Uh, so to do this, we take our x sub i and our z sub i uh, design matrices, we concatenate them uh, into some F sub I matrix. We also go ahead and concatenate our coefficients um, into some eta sub I uh, coefficient vector. And then we go ahead and do a standard least square solution. Um, so a couple things to call out. Uh, F sub I is almost surely rank deficient. I just told you in most instances that X and Z are, are identical. Um, so we have, um, a non-biased estimator here. You only have unbiasedness when your design matrix is um, not rank deficient. And we have aliasing in our eta coefficients. Um, if we just said we're done, we'd have some big problems on in identifiability. Um, but we're still gonna be able to utilize these etas. Um, we go ahead and uh, in the algorithm, we go ahead and do a, a compact singular value decomposition of the F design matrix. Um, we're gonna utilize notions of uh, V1 and V2. Um, these are just gonna be uh, the first P and the last Q columns of the right singular vectors, um, where P and Q are the number of fixed effects and random effects accordingly, or the length of beta and gamma accordingly. Um, and then utilizing these, I'm gonna show you guys some uh, linear algebra on the screen. I, I encourage you guys to read the paper to get the, the full details here. I couldn't help but showing it because I think it's cool. Um, we can get an unbiased estimate of the dispersion of the model. Uh, it's maybe not the best unbiasedness. There's no guarantees about the variance of this, but it is an unbiased estimate of the dispersion in your model. Um, using a matrix sum, we can get an unbiased estimate of uh, the beta vector. And then if we knew beta, uh, we could get an unbiased estimate of your covariance matrix of the sigma vector. Um, there's a lot going on here. Uh, I'm watching the clock, so I'm gonna uh, skip over the details. Again, I, uh, I highly encourage you to read the paper. Uh, one note I will dwell on, um, this would be an unbiased estimate if we knew beta. We don't, we only have an estimate of beta hat. Um, in practice, we use this as a plug-in estimator. Uh, that means that um, sigma hat is not unbiased, but in practice, the bias introduced is negligible. Um, lastly, there's nothing, no guarantee here that sigma is a positive semi-definite. Um, we can do a projection that's theoretically well-motivated. Um, finally, with an estimate of uh, all of our etas, with an estimate of beta, with an estimate of sigma, um, we can go ahead and um, uh, do an empirical Bayesian estimate of um, what each of our gammas are. Um, every one of these steps, although I've been flying through them, is non-iterative. Um, and that's the attractiveness about this uh, approach. So again, that was a lot of detail. I didn't expect most people uh, to follow through that. Um, the paper is great. Uh, please go ahead and give it a read. Uh, the summary um, in a cartoon form is this. Um, we have k separate processes. 
Uh, these are associated with our grouping levels. Each one of these is gonna estimate um, one of our eta coefficients. Uh, we will then collect all of those estimates into some um, central process. We'll use that to estimate our dispersion, um, our beta coefficients, um, the sigma for our gammas, um, and then we will broadcast those estimates down to the worker nodes, um, and we can use them to get a posterior, a maximum apostory uh, estimate of the gamma coefficients. So um, here is a plot comparing LME4 and MBEST. Again, this is still in the R world. Um, it's the same simulation data I started with. Um, on the left, we have root mean squared error. You can see that LME4 is slightly better than MBUS, but uh, the difference is fairly small um, and diminishes with more data. Um, on the right, we have a plot uh, where the y-axis is a uh, log um, seconds to fit. So MBUS is much, much faster than LME4 and scales much better. Um, this really unlocks a variety of uh, practical problems. Um, in recommender systems and data science in general. Um, there's a problem with the R implementation, and that's memory. Um, for large N and M, um, current software is infeasible. Um, I don't have uh, orders of complexity, but I do know that when I try to run uh, large models on my MacBook Pro, I, I totally run out of memory, it can't work. Um, but if you, you know, we're following a little bit about the methods, I think you can see how uh, the Spark uh, software is a perfect um, piece of technology for this software. So we went ahead and ported all of this to uh, an open source Spark package. Um, it's fairly easy to use, although in its early stages, um, all you have to do is create some data frame, um, just like you would in R or Python, where you have the features that you want to model. Um, go ahead and decide some number of partitions uh, that you want to distribute to different processes. Um, declare some model. You know, of your data frame, you need to say uh, which features do you want to model at the fixed effect level. These are, you know, features you want to model the average impact of, and which features you want to model at the random effect level. These are per grouping level, be it client, item, however you've decided to partition your data. Um, how do you want to model relative differences from the average? Um, select a family. Right now we only support linear and logistic regression, although we're hoping to improve that in the future. Um, and then ask the model to fit. Uh, right now, we support predictions. We support some model introspection. Um, and it works. <laughs> so I've been using this myself. Um, I recently fit a model um, with uh, on the order of 120 million observations um, at the client level, so with millions of clients. Um, the number of coefficients uh, per grouping level was relatively modest, about eight. Um, but, you know, when you multiply that by the number of grouping levels, you're really fitting a model jointly with millions of parameters. Um, we ran this on our Spark implementation with uh, eight X executors, 16 gigabytes of memory each, um, and it finished in about 40 minutes. Um, there might be, we might be able to tune that a little bit faster. Uh, I'm really in the early days of using this software. Uh, as I mentioned, the current limits of uh, the Spark implementation is that we only fit linear and logistic regression models. Uh, we're planning in the future to extend that to the typical class of generalized linear models, Poisson models, whatever you normally use in R or Python. Um, the current implementation only supports um, one uh, level of partitioning your data, so one grouping level. Um, the methods behind this uh, moment-based estimation have been progressing. There's now um, techniques for fitting uh, models with arbitrary nesting uh, grouping structure. Um, so for the stitch fix example, you could think client clusters and then individual clients nested under that. Um, so we're hoping to extend the software uh, to those approaches soon. Um, finally, the model introspection today is fairly bare bones. Um, there's no methods in the package for generating credible intervals. Um, another use case of mixed effects models or hierarchical models beyond recommender systems is for A-B testing. Uh, if you're running an A-B test and you have um, multiple clients uh, showing up in, in uh, several observations, those observations aren't uh, independent, using a hierarchical model is a great way to, um, in a statistically principled way, control for that um, aliasing or clustering of your data. Um, so we'd like to uh, extend the software uh, to that application in the short term. 
So thank you. That's the end of my talk. Um, I hope you check out the, uh, the package. We open sourced it just a couple days ago. Um, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Happy to answer any questions. So four questions. Um, there is a microphone there and there. Um, please stand up and go to the microphone. Uh, it'll help with the recording. Hi, this is a very basic question. Um, if you have, in the, in the context of this problem, you have, if you want a prediction, how important is actually to have unbiased estimator, estimators? Uh, and if so, uh, how do you help uh, the other people in the company to interpret these estimators? Because, uh, in, you know, when you have logistic regression, it's really hard to interpret the, the estimators. So that's my question. So, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit of an echo. Could you, uh, I heard something about interpreting the, the estimates. Yeah, well, that's, compar that's a compar the question. The first one is how important is to have unbiased estimators when you have, when you, what you actually want to do is uh, predict uh, some, uh, uh, something within your model. I mean, it, it's, is it really important to have unbiased estimators when you only care about the, the, the prediction? Yeah, so the, so the first question is how important is it to have a, an unbiased estimator? Um, it depends. I mean, if I can get unbiasedness for free, I'll take it. Uh, but, you know, it's not the end all be all in a prediction uh, problem. All right, thank you, Kyle. Thank you.